Good morning, everyone. Good morning as we are uh, here to finish out our class lesson on Galatians. Uh, we're going to be looking at the, the last few verses. We're going to be starting in chapter 6 and verse 11, going through the end of the chapter and go through the end of uh, Paul's epistle to the churches in Galatia. Um, and so we're, uh, um, I, I hope that you've enjoyed this series. I know I have. It's been a, a lot of fun and, and, and very interesting uh, to be able to really dig into uh, to this letter. And I hope that you've been able to get something out of this, something you can use. And uh, hopefully the, the fact that we've, these are recorded and are on YouTube and Facebook um, if you ever need to go back and reference them or something, uh, that's that's a, that's a valuable resource there for you if you need to. And um, uh, but uh, and I, I, again, I hope that you've enjoyed this. I hope you've uh, been able to, to to get something out of it, to be able to use uh, use in your life, and to be able to uh, and hopefully share with others, uh, which is most important. So, uh, a few things real quick before we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, been a few questions about whether we are going to continue classes. Uh, for our uh, the congregation at East Side, and the answer is yes, uh, we are. I will not be doing that. Uh, you don't have to. You won't have to look at me anymore. Uh, we are. Um, we're going to be starting a new series uh, starting next Sunday, and we're going to have a series of men doing this. And uh, I wrote it down. Make sure I get it right. There's going to be uh, the series is called Heroes from Hebrews. And this is Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith, and uh, James Trent is going to be doing uh, a, a, the lesson next Sunday. Uh, he is going to be uh, recording kind of an intro uh, to kind of get this kicked off and, and, and starting with this. And then after that, there will be, um, I, I don't really know who and I don't know how many, but there will be a series of men who will be uh, doing uh, different classes over those uh, very, very faithful people uh, who were spoken of in, by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11. And each one will be, uh, if I if I think we're going to do it this way, we'll be picking a different person and and, and kind of talking about their faith and, and the stuff, the, 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 the things that they did. Uh, and so I, I really look forward to. It. I think it's going to be a wonderful lesson, uh, a series of lessons. So hopefully you will tune in for that. Uh, as far as I know, everything will be kind of the same way. This will we'll still be doing them on Facebook and and, and YouTube. And uh, and again, you'll get to hear from quite a few of uh, the men in East Side as they uh, they bring a, a lessons from God's word. So. Uh, also, uh, I was debating as to whether I would do this, but you know, I I just can't help myself. So, um, I, just real quick, and uh, just because uh, uh, I, I'm the one in front of the camera, so I get to do this. But uh, um, coming up on uh, Tuesday, June second, I think that's right. That Tuesday, June second is um, is uh, my wife and I's nineteenth wedding anniversary. So I wanted to say um, uh, that uh, uh, say. Thank you uh, to her, and that um, uh, that I love her, and, uh, and thank you so much for everything that she does for me, and that she has done for our daughter, and done for our family, and uh, and I uh, don't know where, don't even want to think about where what we'd be, what I'd be doing, or where I'd be if it wasn't for uh, wasn't for her. So I just want to um, say that here, and uh, that I appreciate that, and uh, and I'm going to go ahead and apologize now, as uh, she is probably going to be yelling at me from the other room for embarrassing her. So. Um, but that's okay. I'll, I guess I'll I'll suffer through that. So, uh, is um, so let's let's go ahead and uh, and get started uh, as we move on. So as we're coming to the close here, of Paul's letter uh, in the previous section, um, Paul encouraged the Galatians to carry each other's burdens uh, when someone was uh, was caught in sin, and, and this is the kind of the logical end to the argument that he's been making this entire letter, and uh, he has spent much of the letter arguing against. Uh, circumcision and, and works of the law, and uh, and then in uh, the first ten verses of chapter six, which we dealt with last week, he argued for the kind of the logical consequence of this position. Uh, what would happen if you uh, if you decide to follow the the law as opposed to uh, as opposed to the gospel of Christ? And uh, you know, if we're all in this together. It basically, what he's saying in these, these first 10 verses, if we're all in this together, if we're working together, then we ought to bear one of those burdens and we can help each other to be able to, to live the life that we should. However, Paul can't help but circling back to his original arguments against circumcision, uh, to be specific, and, and, uh, but the, the, the works of the old law, and, and, and anybody who might be teaching this. So in this section, Paul's going to make a, an explicit contrast between the agitators from Jerusalem and from Christ. And so for Paul, this is what's going to make all the difference, is the, the, the very stark contrast between these two. 
So we're going to go ahead and jump in and, and, and start looking at this. And we're actually the, we're going to start off with just read the first verse of this section. We're going to read chapter 6 and verse 11. It says, See what, with, what, with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It maybe seem kind of a weird spot to just stop right there. But So let's look a little bit about this, uh, where uh, Paul kind of begins his conclusion. So near the close of the letter, Paul, um, he, he kind of, he calls special attention to what he was writing. And what we don't mean is that, I don't know talking about the content, but he's bringing special attention to the document itself, uh, the actual letter that he is writing. So it was Paul's custom to dictate to a uh, professional scribe or to someone who was uh, well-versed in, in, in writing and, and um, uh, is the profession typically. And these people would write for him. Uh, Tertius uh, was one subscribe. He has identified himself towards the end of Paul's letter to uh, the Romans. So, um, but even though Paul uh, used a scribe, he would typically write the concluding remarks in his own hand. He would typically write them himself. He says that a few times. Um, in, uh, and so uh, in comparison... Uh, to the small, neat writing, neat handwriting of, of the uh, the scribe, it appears that Paul has basically saying, he said, in my kind of large handwriting, maybe clumsy handwriting, I don't know, uh, but he's kind of, you know, in, in these large letters. Now, uh, scholars argue as to why that was, and we, we don't know, uh, but I, I did want to point out some of the things that they said I thought was interesting as to why he, why he had large letters that he wrote in as a teacher myself. Um, it is, it is amazing how different people's handwriting can be. Some people write really, really small. Some people write really big. Um, some people, you can, it's just beautiful writing. Others, not so much. Uh, so, but it's, there's all different types of writing. But some people say that Paul's writing might have been that of, the, of a workman's hand. Uh, he was not. A, he, he worked uh, for a living. He was a tent maker. And so he, uh, what, maybe his hands, maybe that was what caused him to have his handwriting not to be as good. Maybe he had failing eyesight. It's harder to see. Um, maybe he just had a desire to just emphasize this point. Maybe he just wrote really big to really point it out. We don't really know. But it is interesting that he did make it a point to say specifically what it was he was doing. Um, but it is important that the uh, correspondence that Paul write could be identified, though, as being genuinely his. It was very important. Uh, to the Thessalonians, uh, Paul wrote, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness uh, in, um, in every letter of mine. So this genuine idea is a, is a matter of authentic, uh, authentication. He, he, uh, he himself wrote concluding remarks in his own hand as a way to authenticate what it was that he was writing, to make sure that they knew, yes, this is coming from me. So I think it's one of the reasons scholars tend to think that maybe the big letters and stuff, that that was kind of his signature, that people knew that it was from him. Again, we don't really know, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's a kind of interesting way to, uh, uh, to look at that. Um, so let's go ahead and move on, uh, and we'll move through these next few verses. So this is going to be uh, chapter 6, verse 12 through verse 16. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they, des they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation." And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So before finishing the letter, Paul returns his attention back to the threat of the Judaizers. So there's several opinions about Paul's words in, in verse 12. And let's read that again. It says, in, It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So there's a, there's a there's different opinions, differing opinions as to kind of what Paul's words are about. So first, we do know that the Judaizers were looking to make to as it says make a good showing instead of being shamed by the Gentile Galatians. And so, you know, good showing in the flesh this had to do with the, the circumcision of the Gentile Christians. That they, they wanted to have a good showing of them. They wanted to, um, they were willing to, or wanted to make sure that they were someone that they could 
be around, maybe have meals with, and things like that. Again, a good showing in the flesh. So the question that arises here is this, and I'm going to read this question to you. Uh, this comes from a, a scholar that I found. It said, how could this literal circumcision matter so much to Jews who had come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah? How could they still cling so tenaciously to this minor surgery that they would refuse to share a common meal with their Gentile brothers who had not submitted to it? Okay, so again, the question is, is if they had taken on Jesus as the Messiah, why did this idea of circumcision mean so much to them that they were willing to not break bread, they were willing to not have a meal with their other Gentile Christians. And this is what we're talking about when it says that they were they wanted this to make good showing uh, a good showing in the flesh. This is where we're coming from. So the question the answer to this, the questions are generally answered in the kind of in the next line. It said only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. I want you to let that sink in for a second. Why were they wanting so much for the Gentile Christians to be circumcised? Because they did not want to be persecuted because of the cross. They were looking to get out of probably Jews somewhere in Jerusalem, Galatia, we'll talk about that in a second, who were persecuting them because they were saying, you were Jewish and now you're following this Jesus. Why are you doing this? They didn't want to be persecuted for that. And so they were calling for the Gentiles to be uh, circumcised also. So let's move on uh, with that. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. So this, the, the thing is, the one thing about this explanation, though, is it does not specify who the threat was coming from, who exactly was threatening these, these Judaizers uh, with persecution. Now, most likely they were Jews and uh, they did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They were, they were not believers. So it's possible that they were coming from Jerusalem, that these were, uh, these were people who were coming in from Jerusalem who were persecuting. Um, it's possible that they, maybe they reasoned, the, the, the Jewish Christians in Galatia reasoned, that by teaching that you needed to be circumcised, maybe they thought this was going to help protect the church in Jerusalem. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they thought that if they were, if they could convince the Jews in Jerusalem that they were actually converting people to Ju to Judaism, and that this would minimize the impact that the these these people who were uh, actively speaking out against um, the, the the Christians in Jerusalem and in Galatia, it's a possibility. But I, I, I truly hope that that wasn't the case because they're basically lying. Uh, they're, they're lying for, uh, to try to get out of being persecuted, which just compounds the issue. Another possibility is that these were people persecuting them in Galatia. Um, the, the Judaizers wanted the one, they, maybe they had friends. Maybe they wanted to maintain their fellowship with other Jews. And in order to do that, they had to make sure that those Christians, these, these Gentile Christians over here, were... Uh, were clean, as they say, something that they could associate with. And uh, this was a way, uh, the best way to put it is maybe they, were, they, were, they wanted the best of both worlds, maybe. Again, we don't really know. It doesn't tell us specifically why or who was persecuting them. But that gives you some, maybe some possible examples as to why that was actually going on. You know, Paul shows the futility of the Judaizer's position when he stated that those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. You know, but even if they did not, but even though they did not keep the law, they wanted the Gentiles to be circumcised. So this basically means that they were asking other people to accept the yoke of the law, the whole law. And Paul has already talked about this previously, but they're asking them again. He's asking them, we want you to take on the whole law, even though we're not actually following it ourselves. You know, but Paul does not see this as their primary motive. That's not what he sees. He says, rather than putting their emphasis, and I'll read this to you. He says, rather than putting their emphasis on how following the law might help one to have more of a fulfilling life, they were ready to boast in your flesh, is what it says, what Paul says. They were evidently, they, they seem to be glorying in the number of people that they can include to undergo circumcision. Now, this is likely tied into that previous verse where, as to why they were being persecuted, and maybe because they didn't want to be persecuted because of the cross of Christ. And, and so, this, I, I think there's a tie in here that they were trying to convince other Jews is that maybe they were saying, you know, so, well, look, we're, we're, we're getting all these people over here to be circumcised, and, and so we're helping them become Jewish, Jewish. 
and they were using that as a way to kind of hold off the, those, the unbelievers who were attacking Christians. Again, that's a, I, I hope that that wasn't why they were doing it, but that sure seems like that that was kind of where they were coming from. Um, the, the reference to your flesh shows that they were concentrating on the physical instead of bringing people to the spiritual. So Paul goes on uh, to distance himself from any such boasting uh, that the, these Judaizers seem to be doing. He says, but far be it from me, uh, whenever he, he's talking about this, this signifies a, a, a device, or excuse me, decisive taking up of a different position. Now, uh, some translations say, but as for me, um, both of which kind of work that way. And there's a, this is a very, very important kind of terminology to look at whenever we're trying to get the idea of why that Paul was being completely opposite of what they were doing. These people were boasting in the amount of Gentile Christians they were able to get circumcised. They were boasting in that. They were boasting in their flesh. Paul says, but far be it from me. Okay, now, this is, uh, I'm a history teacher, and so this is something that, as I was reading that, I was, I was studying through this, I was taking notes, and this just kept coming back in my mind. So I'm going to read something that is extra biblical. This is, a, this is something just from an, an actual American history um, little piece here. But I think it might give you a little bit of an, a, a better understanding as what exactly this oppositeness was that Paul was, was, was looking at. So I'm going to read this to you, and maybe you'll recognize it. Um, you'll, I'm guessing you'll recognize it when we get to the very end, but maybe you'll recognize it before we get there. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What, excuse me, what would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Now, hopefully you recognize a very, very famous speech by Patrick Henry, one of our founding uh, authors and, and, and writers, as he was talking to the, uh, uh, this, the, in this very uh, profound speech. Now, again, there's no connection to that whatsoever in, in, with our writing here. But what I wanted to get to you was that very, very last line, the most famous part of this, where it says, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. That's the same terminology that Paul was using. It's important to understand that whenever he said this, whenever he made this speech in the mid 1770s, the, the war had, the Revolutionary War had basically started, but the majority of Americans did not agree with him. They were very much adamant against that. And, against that. and so he stood up and basically said, give me liberty or give me death. I am going the exact opposite. All right, so a little bit of my history nerdness there. I'm sorry I had to throw that in there. But I hope that it gives you a better understanding of what exactly Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I am exactly opposite from what they are doing. I will never boast in what these Judaizers are boasting in. That that is absolutely not appropriate. I'm totally against that. Paul declines to glory in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that he will boast in. And that is, some, that is the exact opposite of what they're doing. And so hopefully that gives you a little better uh, kind of understanding the wording. Now, uh, it is very easy for us to miss a very, very important piece of what Paul just says. Except, when he says, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a very, very important piece that we need to make sure that we, we cover with this. This was a very, very shocking assertion that Paul was making, okay? Something that we have, we've lost 2,000 years later. Crosses and crucifixion was not mentioned in polite society. This was not something in the Greco-Roman world and really in anywhere in the Roman world that somebody would have just sat around and talked about as being a, you know, this was not something you had in a normal, you know, polite dinner. It, it just, you just didn't talk about it. Crucifixion was something that was reserved for 
slaves. It was reserved for the vilest of criminals, something we've, we've talked about, something that is very well known uh, and something that is, makes it so much more profound that Jesus would sacrifice on a cross for us. But the concept that we need to make sure that we understand now, I've, 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 I have personally mentioned this in class, in, in, in some of my classes. I actually got this from someone else. Um, but this is, and so let me kind of explain through a little bit kind of where I want to go with this. Um, we have the idea of wearing crosses or decorating our houses with them or something like that is a, is a really interesting concept if you're looking at it from a first century viewpoint. This kind of shows, it kind of gives us the perfect example of just how we've lost, how profound Paul's wording here would have been, where he is telling the people in Galatia that I only boast in the cross. Okay, that would have been very, very profound for them. That would have been a really hard thing for them to swallow. Um, as I have heard this in other classes, and I have said this in my class before, in classes that I have, I have taught before, to a person in the first century, the idea of wearing a necklace with a cross on them would be the equivalent of us wearing a pendant with an electric chair on it. Okay. Now I've had people that have told me it's like, well, that's that's kind of shocking. I don't, I'm I'm sorry. That's I'm, it's that's kind of hard to, to to swallow you saying that. You know, the, the cross is a very sacred thing. You're absolutely right, but we need to make sure we understand something. There's something very important with this. The generalization of just crucifixion, just the, the concept of the execution of criminals on a cross or something like that, that is not sacred. Okay? What is sacred is the cross of Christ, is the crucifixion of Christ, his sacrifice for us, for the whole world, for giving us the ability to spend eternity with him. That is the sacred part. So it's very, very important that we don't put an emphasis on the physical representation. Now, does that make it bad per se? Oh, absolutely not. No, I'm not, no, not, not trying to say that, you know, wearing a cross or decorating a house is a bad thing. It is not. But it is important to, in, a, in order for us to really understand, to fully understand what Paul is saying to his readers in Galatia, and every time that any of the writers of the New Testament wrote about the cross, how profound it would have been, how hard it would have been uh, to, for them to accept that, because that would have been such a such a harsh thing to boast about, which is exactly what Paul is saying. And, and so you need to really understand where it is that Paul is coming from. Uh, Jack McKinney said this, even though the cross of Jesus was a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, it was the only thing worthy of Paul's boast. Now those uh, stumbling block and foolishness both come out of 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23, uh, where, uh, where Paul says that. So again, I, I apologize for kind of going off on that little tangent, but I, I, as I was studying through that, I, I wanted to make sure that you understood just how important it was that what Paul was saying here, that his wording was, was very profound to them. So Paul, the thing is though, Paul not only uses this unmentionable word, the cross, that would have been something you would not have heard in polite society in Greco-Roman world, he gloried in it, as do we and as we should. He saw with clarity that the central truth of Christianity is that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross for the salvation of sinners, of whom he saw himself as chief, coming from 1 Timothy 1. So no matter how unpalatable or how hard it is for the, the people of his day, he saw that it was the truth that must be proclaimed with emphasis. It's very, very important. He knew that no matter how hard it was for them to swallow, they had to understand the truth. And so that's something we need to be able to kind of take a step back and, and look as to how hard it would have been for them to accept that and to understand that on our terms as to how hard it would have been uh, for sometimes even people today to accept that same concept and how much we must continue to give them the truth. So the final words of this epistle concerning the cross are, are striking in and of themselves. Uh, Paul says, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So these words uh, can be used to summarize the entire life and death of, of Paul, of the Apostle Paul. Um, for Paul, the world was dead. It had been crucified. The world around him, the world he had lived in, had died to him. And the other side of the coin is that, and I to the world. 
And so as for the world was concerned, Paul, or I like this better, Saul was dead. And Paul was born. Paul was born a new creation. Look at the measure that was he had given himself over to Christ. He had ex- basically, had, he's telling his readers here, and in Paul's mind, he had, the world had died. He had crucified the whole world to move that away, move himself away from that world, and he had been born a new creation as Paul. This was not just an interesting kind of piece of his life. It was his life. It was a death to the whole way of life. It was a rising of a new mode of existence. Again, a, a new creation. So circumcision was of critical importance to the issues at hand in the churches of Galatia. Obviously, this was something that, that Paul spent the better part of this entire uh, epistle writing about. So those who pushed for it saw that it was something divinely commanded. The Judaizers, uh, it was obvious that they were, they believed this was something that was important, uh, at least on some level. Uh, so while Paul did not minimize the its rightful place in the world in the way, especially in the old law, he is denying that either the observance or the non-observance of this ritual requirement is important to the scheme of salvation. He's making it very clear. Do it or don't do it. It doesn't change anything whenever it comes to salvation. Um, what does matter, as we have kind of already mentioned a second ago, is a new creation. So when a sinner comes to trust in Christ and to take on him in baptism, there is a new creation. They are they die to the world and they're born again as a new creation. And this was the heart of Paul's gospel. This was the part, the heart of what the Holy Spirit was leading him to preach, and this is the him to proclaim. And it contrasts completely with what the Judaizers were teaching. And this is another reason why I've spent a little bit of time talking about how important it is to see. The, these different wordings and, and to see that it is so incredibly important that what he was preaching was the exact opposite of what the Judaizers were trying to give. So when Paul refers, though, to all who walk by this rule, and so he's not talking about rule keeping per se. What he's talking about is just basically how a Christian should live. Uh, originally, the Greek uh, word for rule here um, signified a measuring rod, but over time it kind of took on the idea of rule of conduct or um, a standard, like a, a standard of judgment. Um, and so the, the question is then, what was the rule or standard by which Paul told the Galatians to live? Um, now, some think that he is referring to this previous verse where he says, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. That's, that's the standard that we're living in, that you are a new creation. Others, though, kind of include other details to this. And I want to read this one to you. This again comes from Jack McKinney, which I really, enjoy, I really appreciate what he said here. It says, therefore, this rule, quoting from Paul, said, this rule could be summarized in the following way. One must trust in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, which makes the new creation possible, and realize that physical circumcision is irrelevant in regard to salvation. So it's a little bit more, it's kind of an all-encompassing idea. This rule for Christians to live by is that you are a sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ is what has made you a new creation. And that all these other things, like, for example, circumcision, are uh, they're, they're irrelevant, irrelevant to, uh, into salvation. So, um, so we now need to take a, a moment to clarify a little bit, a little bit more wording here um, that we're going to look at, especially when we're, when we're looking at the Greek. So the question is then, whom did Paul have in mind when he offered a blessing when he says, upon the Israel of God. Now, my translation says, peace and mercy be upon them, comma, and upon the Israel of God. That certainly sounds like there's two groups. Okay, well, we're going to talk about that for a little bit. Now, the issue that arises here is a Greek word, kai. All right, now, th- this is typically translated and. That's, the, that's kind of the normal way of looking at that. Um, thus, the sentence says, what my translation I just read to you, says, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And in a lot of, many of the translations translate it just like that. The conjunction chi, though, can function in a lot of different ways. It actually works in, in other, um, uh, other ways. It's, it's basically more than just a simple connective uh, of two parts. Um, here, we're dealing with what's called an explicative chi. Okay? Now, 
to put this simply, and I'm not a grammar person, so I had to look this up. So uh, and this is, uh, to put this simply, the word or clause coming after the conjunction serves to explain what goes before it. Okay, so in other words, what comes after is explaining what was just said before. It's not an and, which means both, or like two things. It's the second one is actually explaining what was in front, or what it came after. So in other words, the translation is really better if it says that is to say, or even, okay? Either one of those. Um, I, I did find this, the NIV, the 1984 translation of the NIV, uh, they did a pretty good job on this. It says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Very different way of looking at that. Now, once this use of Kai is understood, it kind of clarifies that Paul's reference here is to the church. Because it sounds like he's saying to the nation of Israel. That is not who he's talking to. He's talking to the church, God's spiritual Israel. So if Kai is translated and instead of even then Paul was acknowledging two distinct groups coexisting in the kingdom of God. Those who walk by this rule and those who do not. Okay? This, this can't be true. This is, this is not true. It can't be that way. So since those who refuse the principles that he just laid down in verse 15, this automatically excludes them from the spiritual Israel. So while Jewish Christians and had a place in the kingdom, Gentile Christians had a place in the kingdom, there was no reservation for the unbelieving. Okay, Yes, we have Israel, which was the nation of God, but as soon as they did not accept his son, they became the unbelieving. Okay, so it is, it's important to, and this was something that uh, I ended up putting a note in my Bible here in the margin because I realized that that's a really important word to understand that we're not talking about um, that we're not talking about two different groups here. We're not talking about those who believe and those who don't. We're not talking about the Israel of the Jewish Israel out of Jerusalem. What we're talking about here is the church. So again, I hope that makes sense. Um, I, I highly highly recommend that you uh, uh, that you do some more studying on that on your own. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a really good uh, a good thing to to look at, especially the Greek there. So let's go ahead and move on. We're going to move just just read verse seventeen. So from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Now, so Paul's finally kind of, he's come to the end of his letter. Uh, the, the words from now on can also be translated as finally or to conclude. So the whole letter um, has pretty much made it clear that Paul has, has had some pretty considerable, considerable opposition uh, from those uh, in Galatia with the Judaizers, and and uh, he has argued pretty strongly against his opponents. So now he is asking them, stop troubling me. Um, I, I've given you the arguments. I've given you what you need to to hear to explain this. So stop troubling me. He, you know, he is always ready to argue. He's made it very clear that he's ready to argue the truth with anyone who opposes that truth, the truth of the gospel. But he, at this point, he is looking to remain in peace. Using vivid yet some unusual language, Paul states the reason that the Judaizers should cease this harmful language, these, these harmful actions that they're doing. Um, and he says, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Now, in one respect, uh, we're probably talking here about this is metaphorically uh, to indicate Paul's identity as a, as a bond servant or a slave to Christ. Um, that, uh, that it was very common for slaves, bond servers, to, to be given a brand or a mark. Um, I, I did notice that some translations actually say the brand mark of Jesus. Uh, they translate it that way. So uh, that's, you know, often a uh, mark in the hand or forehead or in the ear um, would have been common. And so, uh, he talk, but he's talking about um, the actual metaphorical mark uh, of being a, a, a bond servant or a slave of, of Christ. Interestingly enough, uh, the word for mark here is stigma. Um, now, you might recognize stigmata, uh, which is a more of a modern day, um, I, I, I believe that kind of predominantly associated with the Catholic Church, very commonly associated with movies and TV shows, but, um, but, as, but the idea, idea of a stigma or something that is, um, that it is um, how do I define that? Um, help me out. Uh, 
I knew I should have written that one down. Um, but a, 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 a something that is a a, a, a stigma. Um, I'm just I'm completely lost a blank on that as a way to, to translate that. Um, I don't have time to, to, to sit and rack my brain on that one. I apologize for that. I should have written that down. Um, Okay. Yes. There you go. Like a black mark or something that's against you um, is a good way. And again, I'd recommend you you look that up. But the, again, the word here, mark, the Greek word that is is stigma. Um, other ways that you might that is also translated from the Greek: a scar left by a hot iron, a brand, a mark of shame or discredit, an identifying dece- a disease. These are ways the Greek word is translated. Also works well um, with the the English translation of that. So in another sense. Uh, the language here is quite literal. Uh, it was Paul was seriously wounded and, and injured multiple times in his mission work uh, and servants to Christ. And so, um, so the, not only these marks that he says, these, the brand marks or marks of Jesus, uh, would work both metaphorically and literally um, here. All right, so then let's look at the very last verse. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. To conclude this letter, Paul invariably uh, has a prayer for grace for his readers. You know, it was fundamental to him that believers owe all their spiritual blessings to the unmerited favor of God. This is the the note in which he delights to end pretty much all of his letters, uh, this idea of grace. Uh, One commentator stated this, The epistle must close with grace, for the whole theme is an appeal to live by grace. Finally, Paul ends his letter by referring to his readers as brothers. And I want to read uh, uh, from commentator uh, uh, Leon Morris because I, I really appreciated what he, he said uh, dealing with the idea of ending with brothers. So it's coming at the very end of the letter as it does shows that despite all the problems to which he has referred in this epistle and the undoubted forcefulness of his opponents, Paul still sees himself as at one with his correspondence. And that is something that is so amazing about what Paul is able to do and the way that he is able to write and the way so forcefully to argue the truth, but to always keep close to the people that he is writing to. So uh, that wraps up the, uh, the books of Galatians. I'm going to give you a few verses uh, that if you'd like to, to write these down, uh, we don't have time to go in and, and, and really go through and look at these. But I want to give you a few verses that you might go back and look at that will give some great, and I'll read the verses to you, that will give you some, uh, some really good things to go back and look at that kind of skip through the, the book here and uh, Paul's letter. They'll give you some ideas of some of the main, the key verses, the main um, themes and points that you might look at. First of all, Galatians 1 and verse 8 says, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. You know, again, I'm not going to talk about these too much, but uh, Paul's very protective of the gospel, and he's very protective of what the Spirit has told him to preach. And he even throws himself into that mix. If I preach to you, if I teach you something opposite of what I taught you before, what the Spirit drove me to teach you, we, I should be accursed. Next, you can look at Galatians 2 and verses 15 and 16. It says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the, this is the, the bottom line. And we talked about this quite a bit in a few of the classes. You have works of the law versus justification by faith. Uh, and, and again, I hope that you will uh, go back and kind of reevaluate and look at those again, this ideas of work the, works of the law versus justification by faith, something that fills in the whole meat of and the middle parts of this book. In Galatians 3 and verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or fem- and female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. The superficial distinctions that are, were brought in so often, especially by the Judaizers in multiple occasions. Uh, this might have been important under the law, but they're no longer valid. That everyone is equal. And then Galatians 5 and verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. You know, Paul is alluding to the common practice in the time whenever uh, a, a slave could possibly go to the temple and they could give money to the temple and the temple would then turn around and purchase that slave's freedom for, or purchase that slave from their owner. 
And then instead of having them be a slave for the temple, they would set them free. This is what uh, God would do for, uh, this is what God does for us. We, he purchases us with the blood of Christ. And instead of keeping us as slaves, he then sets us free in order to live a life that is benefiting to him and to benefiting to his kingdom and his church. Lastly, Galatians 6 and verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The bottom line, do good to everyone, and especially those who belong to the household of faith. In these crazy times, these very intriguing, these dangerous, these scary, so many other words we can throw into these times that we live in, it is so incredibly important to stand apart to be different, to be Christians that are always good to everyone around us. And we can bring souls to Christ through that goodness, through our faith. And we stand up as a pillar. We can be a light in a very dark world. We can be salt and we can be light. I hope that you uh, enjoyed this class. I hope you enjoyed our study of Galatians and I, I hope that you're able to use this in your life, and most importantly, I hope you're able to use this uh, in, in teaching others. Uh, let's end this, this class with, a, with a, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to come to you now and say thank you for all the blessings you give us. Thank you for everything that you do for us every single day. Lord, we, as we are living in a, in a very trying time right now, we ask uh, most especially for you to be with us and to, to give us patience and to give us courage, to give us kindness. Uh, to, to give us, uh, be with us and help us to, to remember that these things are what separate us from the world, that make us a light in this world, and help us to remember that it's through you that we can change so many people's lives. Lord, please be with us in all that we do. Be with us as we study and as we look at these, uh, your scripture, we look at these epistles that were written by so many of your faithful followers that we can be able to use these in our lives and, and, and most importantly, to be able to bring souls to you. Be with us, keep us safe, be with all those who are, uh, who are looking for you every single day. And it's through your son's name. Thank you.